Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for an opportunity to be in your midst yet again. We thank you, Lord, for this people, this group of people who have gathered here today. I pray that during this message, God gives you sitting where you're sitting and you standing where you're standing, the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your heart and eyes of your understanding are supernaturally enlightened during this message, that in so doing, you may know the hope and the calling, his calling for you, that you may know the riches of his inheritance that he's reserved, especially for you because you believe. I pray that within the next 25 minutes or so, your life will be completely transformed to the glory of God, and that when you leave here today, that you will never be the same. If you believe it and you receive it, say amen. 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 Matthew 1619 says that I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and what you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and what you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. In light of that scripture, what would you say if I told you that if you've ever experienced depression in your life, it's probably because you were comfortable with being depressed. That if you've ever experienced loneliness in your life, it's probably because you welcomed it. What would you say if I told you that if you've ever experienced bitterness, resentment, frustration, despair, discontentment, anxiety, or helplessness, you lived it and lived with it because you gave it permission to be a part of your life? Notwithstanding the circumstances surrounding that emotional hardship, Never mind the people that were involved. Never mind how much pain it caused you or how much you wanted to avoid it. It existed in your life because you gave it permission. Now I can tell by the blank stares on your face that this is a tough concept to accept. <laughs> Because what it does is it suggests that you and I, it suggests that we are somehow responsible for our own emotional hardships. It suggests that we're responsible for our own emotional pain. Now hear me. I'm not suggesting that we are always responsible for the circumstances that caused that emotional hardship. I'm suggesting that we are fully responsible for how we responded to those life circumstances and for how long we allowed our response of anger, our response of despair, our response of frustration to live and linger within us. Family, here's why we hold some level of responsibility. All of those emotions that I just talked about, depression, loneliness, anger, stress, despair, frustration, all of that heaviness, those are all spirits according to Isaiah 61 and 3. God's encouraging us to put on a garment of praise and take off that spirit of heaviness. So those emotions, that spirit of heaviness, that's all subject to authority. All of it is subject to authority. Fear can only go where it's told to go, and it can only stay in a place, a dwelling, that it's permitted. My point is that this heaviness that we carry far too frequently in our lives, it only exists in our lives because we give it permission to. Because you do, in fact, have authority over a spirit of heaviness whatever we call it. You do, in fact, have authority over stress. You do, in fact, have authority over depression and insecurity and rejection. You've got authority over it. Permission is a matter of authority. What you permit and don't permit, you can only do so because you've got authority. So today, today I want to remind you of the authority that you have as a believer. And I want to show you a scriptural example of what it looks like to walk 
and the authority that you have. I'm going to show you someone in the Bible who has the same authority that you do and how he handled that spirit of heaviness, all those things that life circumstances has brought him. Amen? Say permission, permission. is a matter of authority. Is a matter of authority. And, I and I have authority. Say, I have authority. I have authority. Say, Urah. Urah. <laughs> Urah settles it. <laughs> Urah takes it from your head, from your mouth, and puts it down into your spirit. Say, Urah. Amen. So what is authority? Well, authority is everywhere. When you look at it, authority is everywhere. There's two types of authority. There's natural authority. That's the authority that's governing this world, right? That's your rules, your regulations, your laws, your statutes, your policies, your procedures, all that other kind of stuff. And then there is spiritual authority. And what you need to know for today's message is that spiritual authority yesterday, today, and forevermore shall always supersede natural authority. Spiritual authority will always supersede natural authority. Spiritual authority has more authority <laughs> than natural authority. Say amen. amen. So here's how it works. There are billions of people all over the world that have authority. Non-believers and believers alike have authority. It's true. Genesis 1.28 says so. Here's the difference. Non-believers, they have authority, but they've got no power to use it because they don't believe. Believers, which is you and I, we have authority because we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Not only do we have that authority, we now have access to tap into the power that lives inside of us to use our authority. There's one other category. That's the enemy. What does the enemy have? What does the devil have? The enemy has power, but he's got no authority to use the power, right? Luke 10, 19 tells us that he has power, but he can't use his power against you and I unless we permit him. He needs permission to use his power against us. Brandy, what does it look like to use his power against us? It looks something like this. The enemy comes to you, and he starts planting a seed in your mind. Just a little simple thought. And he says, the world is a mess. It's horrible out here. All this hatred, all this racism, all this sexism, everything is a mess. And then he looks at you, and he says, and you're a mess. Everything about you is a mess. Your job is a mess. Your family is a mess. You know what? Look at your bank account. Your finances are a mess. As a matter of fact, you know what you are? You're depressed. And then you start thinking, wow, the world is a mess. It's horrible. It's not going to get any better. Wait a minute. My family is a mess. I'm a mess. My finances are a mess. Wait a minute. I think I'm depressed. He planted the seed. You accepted it and started watering it and watching it grow inside of you. That's what happens when we give him permission. We have granted authority to him to attack us. So here's the point. Don't. <laughs> Don't. Because the bottom line is that no spirit of heaviness cannot live inside you unless you grant him permission to. You don't have to accept frustration and anger. You don't have to accept bitterness. You don't have to accept unforgiveness. Don't give it permission. And you don't have to because you've got authority. Say, I've got authority. I've got authority. Oorah. Y'all don't say it with enough excitement like I do. Say, oorah. All right. How much authority do you have? Great answer. You do. <laughs> You've got oodles of authority. <laughs> you do. Let me show you. There's one scripture. It's my absolute favorite scripture. Well, one of my favorite scriptures. I have a lot of them. But it's one of my favorite scriptures. And this scripture actually defines or describes the magnitude of authority that we have. In this scripture, what God is doing is he's assigning his authority to Jesus. But in that assignment, you get to see the, the vastness, the breadth of the magnitude of authority that God has given Jesus. And it's, it's in Ephesians 1 and 20. 120. So I'm going to read it from verse 19 on the screen. It'll pick it up from verse 20. It says, these are in accordance in the working of his mighty strength, 
which he produced in Christ when he raised him from the dead. So when God raised Jesus up from the dead, here's what he did. He seated him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Raised him up from the dead, sat him at his own right hand in heavenly places, and here's what he did. He sat him far above all rule, all authority, all power, all dominion, whether angelic or human, in the natural or in the spiritual. And what he did, he sat him far above every name that can be named. So when he raised him up from the dead, put him at his right hand in heavenly places, above all rule, all authority, all power, and all dominion, he also set him above every name. So that means Jesus is above fear. That's a name. Jesus is above frustration. That's a name. Jesus is above insecurity and loneliness, all of that. And then the scripture goes on to say, then he put all things under Jesus' feet. Right? Jesus has all rule, all authority, all power, all dominion. He's above every name that can be, any name that can be conferred, and all things are underneath his feet. So who has more rule than Jesus? Who's got more power than Jesus? Who has more dominion than Jesus? What name is greater than Jesus? That's a big deal. Say, oorah. You know why it's a big deal? Because God gave you the identical authority. You have the same exact authority. Ephesians 2 and 6 gives it to you. Here's what it says. When you believed and you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the moment that you did that, here's what the Bible says happens to you. You, God, well, God raised you up together with him. God raised you up together with Jesus when you believe. And he sat you in heavenly places. So if you're sitting next to Jesus in heavenly places, guess what? Say what, Brandy? Y'all just left me hanging. It means that you have all rule, all authority, all power, all dominion. And guess what? You are above every name that can be conferred. So that means you are above fear. You are above insecurity. You are above frustration. You are above loneliness. You are above depression. And guess what? All things are underneath your feet. You've got oodles of authority. Say, oorah. I say, I've got authority. So now listen, knowing the authority that you have is just half the battle. It's using the authority that's key. Using the authority that's key. So let's get excited and let's get encouraged because we are going to look at someone who has the same exact identical authority as you do. And we're going to look through a series of scriptures how he was able to use that authority as he was walking on this earth. So who has the identical authority that you do? That was like, like only a couple people. Who has the same authority? Jesus. Exactly. So we're going to take a look at how Jesus used his spiritual authority while he was on this earth. So uh, we're going to look at a couple of days leading to his crucifixion. And we're going to start in John. Now let me give you the backdrop. As we get closer to the crucifixion, Jesus is going from city to city and he's teaching the word of God, right? So he's teaching, he's baptizing, he's healing, he's doing all of that stuff. He's walking around boldly and confidently in the spiritual authority that his father gave him. Yes? What's happening while he's doing that is those that have natural authority, title, position, money, all of that stuff, they don't like it. The more he uses his spiritual authority, the more the world doesn't like it. And the Bible says that the tension is so high there amongst the Sadducees and the Pharisees and all those folks that folks couldn't even speak publicly about Jesus because they were afraid to be arrested or stoned. That's how bad it was. Let's go to John 7, 29. John 7, 29. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees are, are challenging Jesus with regard to his authority. Here's how he responds. He says, I know him myself, him who? His father. Because I am from him and he sent me. So Jesus says, I've got spiritual authority because I got a relationship with my father. That's key number one. Do you have a relationship with your heavenly father? 
He says, I have a relationship with my father, and he sent me, so I'm authorized to be here. Here's what happens next. The Bible says they, the other folks in the world, because they heard that, were eager now to arrest him. Eager. So they might have carried a spirit of frustration, anger, bitterness, jealousy, all of that stuff, because now they're eager to arrest him. But what happens next? No one laid a hand on him because, say this with me, his time had not yet come. What does that mean? Here's what it means. It means Jesus is walking boldly and confidently in his spiritual authority. He's fulfilling God's purpose for his life right now. And although they don't like it, and although they want to arrest him, they can't. Why? Because permission was not granted. <laughs> Say permission not granted. <laughs> so that was when Jesus was talking in the temple. Let's go to John 8 and 20. Now Jesus has moved into the treasury, okay? Different group of people, different teaching, but he's still walking in his purpose. So the world may come at you, continue walking in your purpose. You're operating in spiritual authority. So Jesus is going to another place now, and he's walking in his purpose. So Jesus said, here's 8 and 20, Jesus said these things in the treasury. In other words, he's teaching the same message that he taught in the temple. And what does it say? Who seized him? Scripture up there? No, not yet. Okay, it says, in 8 and 20, it says, no one seized him. No one seized him. Why? Because his time had not yet come. What does that mean? That means permission not granted. Say permission not granted. This whole thing is about operating in spiritual authority. This whole thing is about where we can permit or not permit. Because we have authority, we can permit or not permit. Say permission not granted. Later on at some point after that, now Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples and some other folks that are in the crowd. And what's happening is, my guess is that they're probably questioning him, saying, Jesus, what is going on? They're really trying to go after you. They're trying to seize you. They're trying to stone you. And they're lying on you. They're talking crap about you. Like, what is really, really going on? So Jesus is explaining to them the magnitude of his authority. And I love this because he does it so boldly. Let's read John 10 and 17. We're going to skip, skip one of the scriptures. We're going to go to John 10, 17 through 18. And the scripture says, for this reason, the father loves me because I laid down my own life so that I may take it back again. Here's the magnitude of his authority. He's saying publicly and, and, and loudly, no one takes it, it, his life, away from me. I lay it down voluntarily. I am authorized, here's his authority, and I have the power to lay it down and give it up again. I am authorized, there's his authority, and I have the power to take it back again. This command I received from my father. Jesus is right there in that scripture flexing his authoritative muscles. It sounded like Jesus was saying, Urah. I've got authority. And I've got power. They can't take my life, disciples. Don't worry about that. I'm the one who can lay it down, and I'm the one who can pick it back up again because my father gave me permission to. And I love that he just said that so boldly and publicly that way because it feels like that's something we need to say when life circumstances come our way. We need to publicly and boldly declare the authority that we have to our circumstances. And we need to tell it permission is not granted because I've got authority over my health. I've got authority over how I respond to life circumstances. I love that. So let's just keep going. So now we're going to fast forward a little bit and we're heading to the Last Supper. All right, remember, all of these are examples of Jesus using his spiritual authority. So now here we are, we are at the Last Supper. Jesus is around the table, and he's talking to the disciples, and he's getting ready to tell them about his departure, right? He's getting ready to go, and he's also getting ready to tell them that he's about to be betrayed. So the Bible says that the person that was sitting next to Jesus was the disciple whom Jesus loved, Brandy, I mean John, John, the disciple who Jesus loved, John, he sat next to him, he leaned back to Jesus, and he asked him, Lord, who is it? Who, who's the one that's going to betray you? Jesus says, 
It is the one to whom I'm going to give this piece of bread after I have dipped it. You see any spiritual authority flexing in there? Yes, I'm going to be betrayed, but my betrayal can't happen until I grab a piece of bread and I dip it into the dish. Let's keep going. Let me tell you why I surmise that. So when he dipped the piece of bread into the dish, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. And then after, say after, after, after say after, after, Judas had taken the piece of bread, what happened? When did Satan enter into Judas? After he took the bread. And when did Judas take the bread? After Jesus gave it to him. The betrayal cannot begin until Jesus gave it permission. Permission is, I'm going to grab this piece of bread, I'm going to rip it, I'm going to dip it in a dish, and I'm going to give it to Judas. Then things can kick off. Jesus controls every step of his betrayal. He's flexing his authoritative muscles. Let's keep going. So after Judas has taken the piece of bread, Satan entered into, into him. Then Jesus says to him, to who? Or Satan. Was it Judas he was talking to? He's talking to Satan. Because who needed permission? And who needs permission in your life? Hoorah. Then Jesus says to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. Mm. Family. Jesus controlled every step. When or if he'd be arrested, when or if he would be stoned, when the betrayal can begin, when Satan can enter into Judas, and when Satan can move. Because there's nothing in the scripture after Judas takes the piece of bread, you, it doesn't say anything that happened. You know why? Even though Satan entered into Judas, he needed verbal permission to move. And so Jesus had to publicly say out loud, what you're going to do, do quickly. And so he told Judas and Satan when to move, and then he even told him the speed upon which he needed to do it. Amen. Quickly. <laughs> quickly. Let's keep going. So now, that is, uh, they finished the Last Supper. They're heading on over to the garden. And you know what happens in the garden, right? Judas had to go. He had to move quickly. So he went to go get the folks to come back and to arrest Jesus. So the Bible says that they come with lanterns and torches and weapons. You all know this scene already, right? Let's go to John 18 and 4. John 18, 4. Then Jesus, knowing all that was about to happen to him, went to them. Look about the boldness and the confidence. He didn't stay on the knees, his knees praying, and they came to him. The Bible says that he went to them. And he goes to them, and he says, Whom do you want? They answered, Jesus the Nazarene. So Jesus says to them, I am he. Right? Whom do you want? Jesus says to them, I am he. And Judas, who was betraying him, was also standing with him. And when the Bible says, when Jesus said, I am he, the scripture says, they drew back and fell down to the ground. Y'all did not get excited. You're coming with torches and weapons. You were coming to get me. You ask, I ask you, who are you looking for? You say, my name with your torches and your weapons, and the only thing you do is drop down and fall down to the ground? Yeah. Y'all, that's spiritual authority at its best right there. And I got to tell you, I don't think they just fell down to the ground. I think they fell down in submission and, and humility, recognizing the authority that was in front of them. And I believe they stayed down until Jesus gave them permission to get up. Let's keep going. So, after they had drew back and fell down to the ground, again Jesus asked them, who do you want? They say, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. Then Jesus says, so if you want me, let, me, let these men go their way. Do you know what happened in that last sentence? 
Jesus says, when it comes to you arresting me, permission is now granted. When it comes to my disciples, permission I am he, let these go their way. And how well do we surmise that other than the Holy Spirit revealing it? Because the Bible says that Peter picked up a sword and cut off a soldier's ear. What happened to Peter when he did that? What happened to him? And why? Because permission was, permission was not granted. Family, this is spiritual authority at its best. And this is so important. Why is it important? It's important because you've got the same authority. The same authority. But these circumstances are different, are they? They lied. They were looking to arrest him for no reason. They were bad-mouthing him. He probably went there. There was times when there was no money. He's not relying on all that. The same life circumstances that you have. But he's able to respond to those circumstances by saying permission is not granted. But Brandy, I'm not Jesus. No, you're not. But you've got the same genetic makeup. You have the same spiritual DNA. The, you, you accept him as your Lord and Savior, which means he lives inside of you. That means greater is he that's in you than the fear that's in the world. Greater is he that's in you than the sickness that's in the world. Greater is he that's in you than the bankruptcy that's in the world. You've got spiritual authority over all of that stuff. Because you are far above all rule, all authority, all power, all dominion. You're above every name of the name that can be conferred. And all of that stuff, all of that nonsense that life throws your way is up underneath your feet. You don't have to just let life happen to you, family. You get to happen to life Amen. by flexing your spiritual authoritative muscles and looking at that stuff in the face and saying, permission not granted. So when depression is knocking on your door, you get to stand from the inside, holler back and say, my time has not yet come. Permission not granted. Despair, permission not not granted. Sickness and disease, your permission has not granted. Spiritual authority is yours. Take authority over it. Tap into the power that you have because you received Christ as your Savior. By faith, pick up the Bible, study it, build yourself strong, and start flexing your spiritual authoritative muscles. Amen? Amen. Say, if, I say, if you receive, say, I receive. Amen. Amen. Heads bowed and eyes closed.